Chapter 15. A Desperate Run But this can't be right, said Dune. If the river is the only way out of Ember, why is there just one boat? It's only big enough for two people. I don't know, said Lana. It is strange. Let's look around some more. They stood up. Dune went back to where they'd left the boxes and got another candle. He brought it into the boat room and lit it, and the room grew twice as bright. Right away, they saw what they hadn't noticed before. In the back wall was a door almost as wide as the whole room. When they went up to it, they could see that it, too, was a sliding door. Dune took hold of the handle that was on the right and pulled sideways, and the door rolled smoothly open to reveal more darkness. They stepped in. They could guess from the echoing sound of their voices when they spoke that they were in a tremendous room. Though the ceiling was low, they could see it just over their heads. The candlelight glinted off something shiny, and as they went further in, they could see that the room was filled with boats, row upon row of them, all just like the one in the first room. There must be hundreds, Lina whispered. Enough for everyone, I suppose, said Dune. They wandered around a bit, but there wasn't really much to see. All the boats were the same. Each one contained two metal boxes and two paddles. The room was cold, and the air felt heavy in their lungs. The candle flames burned weakly, so they went back to the small room and slid the door closed behind them. I guess, said Lina, that this first boat is meant as a sort of sample. We learn what's on the one that has signs. Boat, paddles, candles, matches. They went back out to the river's edge. Lina blew out her candle and began closing up the boxes they'd opened. Dune blew out his too. I'm going to take my candle with me, he said, to look at later. I want some matches as well. He took a packet of matches from the box and tucked it inside his shirt. Lina returned the boxes to the boat room and slid the door closed. Then she and Dune stood together on the ledge and gazed down. Less than a foot below, the river rushed by. A short distance downstream, it plunged into the dark mouth in the wall and disappeared. Well, he said, we've found it. We've found it, Lina repeated wonderingly. And tomorrow, at the start of the singing, said Dune, we'll stand up in Harkin Square and tell the whole city. When they came up out of the pipeworks, it was nearly six o'clock. They hadn't realized they'd been down there so long. Both Dune's father and Mrs. Murdo would be wondering where they were. They stood for a moment under a lamppost, just long enough to agree on a time to meet the next day and plan their announcement. Then they hurried home. When Dune's father asked why he was so late, he said his song rehearsal had gone long. He wanted to shout out to his father, We found the way out! We're saved! But he held himself in for the sake of his moment of glory. Tomorrow, when his father saw him on the steps of the gathering hall, he would be so overcome with surprise and pride that he would go weak in the knees, and the people standing next to him would have to catch him and hold him up. And the announcement about the thieving mayor, that would probably happen tomorrow, too. Dune had almost forgotten it in the excitement of finding the boats. The mayor's arrest and the city's rescue, both at once. It was going to be an amazing day. Racing thoughts kept Dune awake almost until morning. The day of the singing was a holiday for the entire city. All the stores and other businesses were closed. This meant that Dune didn't have to go to the pipeworks. His father didn't have to go to his shop either, but he was going to go anyhow. If he wasn't in his shop fussing with his merchandise, he didn't know what to do with himself. Dune dawdled over his breakfast of carrot sticks and mashed turnips, waiting for his father to go. He wanted to get ready for the journey down the river. They probably wouldn't leave for a few days. He and Lina would make their announcement tonight, and people would need time to get organized before they could leave the city. But he was too excited to sit around and do nothing. As soon as his father left, Dune slipped the case off his pillow. This would be his traveling pack. He put in the candle and the matches. He put in the key he'd borrow from the pipeworks office. He put in a good-sized piece of rope that he'd found at the trash heaps and had been saving for years, and a bottle for water. He put in an ancient folding knife that his father had given him, which had come down through the generations of his family, and which he used to chop off his bangs when they got so long they tickled his eyelids. He put in some extra clothes in case he got wet, and some paper and a pencil so that he could write a record of the journey. Along with these things, he crammed in a small blanket. It might be cold in the new city. And a packet of food, six carrots, a handful of vitamins, some peas and mushrooms wrapped in a lettuce leaf, two boiled beets, and two boiled turnips. That should be enough. Surely when they got to where they were going, the people who lived there would give them something to eat. He tied the top of the pillowcase in a knot, and then he untied it again. He might want to add something else. 
He stood in the middle of the apartment and looked around at the jumble of stuff. There was nothing else here that he wanted to take with him. No, there was one thing. He went back into his room. From beneath his bed, he pulled out the pages of his bug book. He leafed through it. The white spider, the moth with the zigzag pattern on its wings, the bee, striped brown and yellow on its rear end. He looked at his drawings for a long time, memorizing their beauty and strangeness. Tiny fringes of hair, minute claws, jointed legs. Should he take this with him? There might not be creatures like this where they were going. He might never see such things again. But no, he'd leave it behind. His pack should be small and light. He put the bug book back under his bed and pulled out the box where he kept the green worm. He drew back the scarf to check his captive one more time. Several days before, the worm had done a curious thing. It had wrapped itself up in a blanket of threads. Since then, it had hung motionless from a bit of cabbage stem. Dune had been watching it carefully. Either it was dead, or it was undergoing the change that he'd read about in a library book, but could hardly believe was true. The change from a crawling thing to a flying thing. So far, the bundled-up worm had shown no signs of life. But now he saw that it was wriggling. The whole wrapped-up bundle, which was shaped like a large vitamin pill, bent slightly from side to side, then was still, then bent back and forth again. Something was pushing at the top end of it, and in the moment, the threads were split apart and a dark, furry knob emerged. Dune watched, holding his breath. Next came two hair-like legs, which clawed and plucked at the blanket. In a few minutes, the whole creature was out. Egress, thought Dune with a smile. The creature's wings were crushed flat against his body at first, but soon they opened, and Dune saw what his green worm had become, a moth with light brown wings. He lifted the box and carried it to the window. He opened the window and held the box out into the air. The moth waved its feathery feelers and took a few steps along the wilted cabbage leaf. For several minutes it stood still, its wings trembling slightly. Then it fluttered up into the air, rising higher and higher until it was just a pale spot against the dark sky. Dune watched until the moth disappeared. He knew he had seen something marvelous. What was the power that turned the worm into a moth? It was greater than any power the builders had had. He was sure of that. The power that ran the city of Ember was feeble by comparison and about to run out. For a few minutes, he stood by the window looking out over the square and thinking again what to pack for his journey. Should he put in anything like nails or wire? Would he need money? Should he take some soap? Then he laughed and struck a hand against his head. He kept forgetting that the entire population of the city would be with him on the trip. If he needed something he didn't have, someone would surely be able to supply it. So he tied a knot in his pillowcase and was about to close the window when he caught sight of three burly men wearing the red and brown uniform of the city guards striding into the square. They stopped and looked around for a moment. Then one of them confronted old humpbacked Nami Progs, who was standing not far from the entrance to the small items shop. The guard towered over her, and she twisted her head sideways and squinted up at him. Dune could hear the guard's voice clearly. We're looking for a boy named Harrow. Why? said Nami. Spreading vicious rumors, was the answer. Do you know where he is? Nami hesitated a, a moment, and then she said, Went off to the trash heaps just a minute ago. The guard nodded curtly and beckoned to his companions. They marched away. Spreading vicious rumors? Dune was so stunned that he stood still as stone for a long minute. What could they possibly mean? But there was only one answer. It had to be what they'd told the assistant guard about the mayor. Why were they calling it a vicious rumor? It was the truth. He didn't understand it. He did understand, though, that Nami Progs had done him a favor. She must have seen that the guards meant him no good. She had protected him, at least for the moment, by sending the guards to the wrong place. Dune forced his mind to slow down and think. Why did the guards think he and Lina were lying? Obviously, they hadn't investigated the room in Tunnel 351. If they had, they'd have known he and Lina were telling the truth. He could think of only one other possibility. The guards, at least some of them, already knew what the mayor was doing. They knew about it and wanted it to stay a secret. And why? It was clear. The guards, too, were getting things from the storerooms. It had to be the answer. For a moment, the fear he'd felt when he saw the guards was replaced by rage. The familiar hot wave rose in him, and he wanted to grab a handful of his father's nails or pot shards and throw them against the wall. But all at once he remembered, if the guards were after him, they'd be after Lina too. He had to warn her. He dashed down the stairs, his anger turning into power for his running feet. 
After discovering the room full of boats, Lina had come home to Mrs. Murdo's with the sound of the river still in her ears. It was like a huge, powerful voice, roaring at the top of its lungs. Deep inside herself, Lina felt an answering call, as if she, too, contained a drop of the same power. She would ride on the river, she could hardly believe it, and it might take her to the shining city she had dreamed of, or it might drown her. What she had imagined before, the smooth, gently sloping path leading out, now seemed childish. How could the way into a new world be so easy? She dreaded going on the river, but she was ready for it, too. She longed to go. She slept that night in the beautiful blue-green room in the big lumpy bed with Poppy next to her. She felt safe here. Mrs. Murdo came in and tucked the covers around her. She sat on the edge of the bed and sang an odd little song to Poppy, something about rock a baby in the treetops. What are treetops? Lina asked, but Mrs. Murdo didn't know. It's a very old song, she said. It's probably nonsense words. She said good night and went out into the living room where Lina could hear humming quietly as she tidied up. She was so orderly. She never left her stockings draped over the back of a chair or her sewing spread out all over the table. Lina closed her eyes and waited for sleep. But her thoughts kept tumbling around. So much was going to happen tomorrow. The whole city would be in an uproar. People would stream down into the pipeworks to see the boats. They'd be excited, shouting and laughing and crying, packing up their belongings and surging through the streets. If they couldn't all fit into the boats, there would be fights. Some people might get hurt. It was going to be a mess. She'd have to keep her little family close around her. Poppy, Mrs. Murdo, and Dune, and perhaps Dune father and, Dune's father and Clary. Through it all, she would hold tight to Poppy so no harm could come to her. It seemed she had barely closed her eyes when she felt Poppy's hard little heels banging against her shins. Time to get up! Get up! Poppy chirped. She got out of bed and dressed herself and Poppy. In the kitchen, Mrs. Murdo was mashing potatoes for breakfast. How lovely, Lina thought, to have breakfast cooked for her, to hear water bubbling in the pot and to find a bowl and spoon set out on the table and vitamins lined up neatly beside a cup of beet tea. I could live here forever, Lina thought, before she remembered that in a day or two they would all be leaving. There was a sudden banging on the front door. Mrs. Murdo dried her hands and went to answer it, but before she'd taken three steps, the banging came again. I'm coming, I'm coming, Mrs. Murdo cried, and when she opened the door, there was Dune. His face was flushed, and he was breathing hard. He had a bulging pillowcase slung over his shoulder. He looked past Mrs. Murdo to Lina. I have to talk to you, he said, right now, but he threw a doubtful glance at Mrs. Murdo. Lina scrambled up from the table. In here, she said, towing him toward the blue-green room. When she had closed the door, Dune told her what had happened. They'll come for you, too, he said, any minute. We have to get out of here. We have to hide from them. Lina could hardly make sense of what he was saying. They weren't in trouble. Her legs went shaky at the knees. Hide, she said. Hide where? We could go to the school. No one would be there today. Or the library. It's almost always open, even on holidays. He hopped impatiently from foot to foot. But we have to go fast. We have to go now. They have signs up about us all over the city. Signs? Telling people to report us if they see us. Lina felt as if a swarm of insects was inside her head, buzzing so loudly she couldn't think. How long do we have to hide? All day? I don't know. We don't have time to think about it. Lina, they could be outside the door this minute. And the urgency in his voice convinced her. On the way through the living room, she gave Poppy a quick kiss and called, Bye, Mrs. Murdo. We have some emergency work to do. If anyone comes asking for me, say I'll be back later. They went down the stairs before Mrs. Murdo could ask any questions. Once in the street, they ran. Where to? Lina said. The school, Dune answered. They took Greystone Street, staying within the shadows as much as they could. As they passed the shoe shop, Lina saw a white piece of paper stuck up on the window. She glanced at it, and her heart gave a wild jump. Her name and Dune's were written on it in big black letters. Dune Harrow and Lina Mayfleet, wanted for spreading vicious rumors, if you see them, report to the mayor's chief guard. Believe nothing they say. Reward. She snatched the poster off the window, crumpled it up, and tossed it in the nearest trash can. In the next block, she tore down two more, and Dune ripped one off of a lamp post. But there were too many to get them all, and they didn't have time to waste. They ran faster. On this holiday, people slept late, and because the stores were closed, the streets were nearly empty. Still, they took the long route all the way around the beehives to avoid 
Spark Swallow Square, where a few people might be standing around and talking. They ran past the greenhouses and up Deadlock Street. As they crossed Knight Street, Lina glanced to her left. Two blocks away, a couple of guards were crossing Greengate Square. She tapped Dune's shoulder and pointed. He saw, and they ran faster. Had they been noticed? Lina thought not. They would have heard a shout if the guards had seen them. They got to the school and went in through the back door. In the wide hallway, their footsteps echoed on the wooden floor. It was strange to be here again, and to be here alone, without the clatter and chatter of other children. The hallway, with its eight doors, seemed smaller to Lina than it had been when she was a student, and shabbier. The planks of the floor were scuffed gray, and there was a cloud of finger smudges around the doorknob of every door. They went into Miss Thorne's room, and out of habit sat in their old desks. "'I don't think they'll look for us here,' said Dune. "'If they do, we can crawl into the paper cabinet,' he set his pack down next to him on the floor. For a while they just sat there, getting their breath back. They hadn't turned the light on, so the room was dim. The only light came from beneath the blind over the window. "'Those posters!' Lina said after a while. "'Yes, everyone will see them.' "'What will they do to us if they catch us?' "'I don't know. Something to keep us from telling what we know. Put us in the prison room, maybe?' Lina ran her finger along the bee carved in the desktop. It felt like a very long time since she'd last sat at this desk. We can't hide in here forever, she said. No, said Dune. Just until it's time for the singing. Then when everyone is gathered in Harkin Square, we'll go and tell about the boats and the mare, won't we? I haven't really thought about it. I haven't had a chance to think all at all this morning. But the guards are always there at the singing, standing next to the mare, said Lina. They grab us as soon as we opened our mouths. Dune's eyebrows came together in a dark line. You're right. So what will we do? It was like finding yourself on a dead-end street, Lana thought. There was no way out. She stared blankly at the things that had once been her daily companions, the teacher's desks, the stacks of paper, the book of the City of Ember on its special shelf. The old words ran through her head. There is no place but Ember. Ember is the only light in Dark World. She knew now that this wasn't true. There was someplace else this place where the boats would take them. As if Dune had read her thoughts, he looked up. We could go. Go where, she said, though she knew right away what he meant. Wherever the river leads, he said. He gestured to the pillowcase. I packed up my bag this morning. I'm all ready. I'm sure I have enough for you, too. Lana felt her heart shrink a little. Go by ourselves, she said, without telling anyone? We will tell them. Dune was on his feet now. He went to the cabinet and got a sheet of paper. We'll write a note explaining everything. A note to someone we trust. Someone who will believe us. But I can't just leave, said Lana. How can I leave Poppy and not even say goodbye to her? Not know where I'm going or if I'm ever coming back. How could you go without saying goodbye to your father? Because, said Dune, once they find the boats, the rest of Ember will follow us. It's not as if we're leaving them forever. He strode across the room and rummaged in Miss Thorne's desk. Who shall we write the message to? Lana wasn't sure about this idea, but she couldn't at the moment think of a better one, so she said, We could write it to Clary. She's seen the instructions. She'll believe what we say, and she lives close by, just up in Torque Square. Okay, said Dune. He pulled a pencil from the desk drawer. Really, he said, this is the perfect idea. We can get away from the guards and leave our message behind us, and we can be the first ones to arrive in the new city. We should be the first, because we discovered the way. Well, that's true, Lana thought for a moment. How long do you think before it will take before the rest of them find the boats and come? It's a lot of people to get organized. She numbered on her fingers the things that would have to happen. Clary will have to get to the head of the pipeworks to go down her, with her and find those boats. Then she'll have to make the announcement to the city. Then everyone in Ember will have to pack up their things, troop down to the river, get all those boats out of the big room, and load themselves in. It could be a big mess, Dune. Poppy will need me. She pictured frenzied crowds of people and Poppy tiny and lost among them. Poppy has Mrs. Murdo, said Dune. She'll be fine, really. Mrs. Murdo is very organized. It was true. The thought of taking Poppy with her on the river, which had darted into Lina's mind, darted out again. I'm only being selfish, she thought, to want to have her with me. It's too dangerous to take her. Mrs. Murdo will bring her in a day or two. This seemed the most sensible plan, though it made her so sad that it was cast a, that it cast a shadow over the thrill of going to the new city. What if something goes wrong, she said. Nothing will go wrong. It's a good plan, Lina. 
We'll be there ahead of everyone else. We can welcome them when they come. We can show them around. Dune was bursting with eagerness. His eyes shone and he jiggled up and down. Well, all right, Lina said. Let's write our message then. Dune wrote for a long time. When he was finished, he showed what he'd written to Lina. He'd explained how to find the rock with the E, how to go down to the boat room, even how to use the candles. It's good, she said. Now we have to deliver it. She paused a moment to see if she had any courage inside her. She found that she did, along with sadness and fear and excitement. I'll deliver it, she said. I'm the messenger, after all. I know back ways to go where no one will see me. An idea struck her. Dune, maybe Clary will be home. Maybe she would keep us safe and help us tell what we know, and we won't have to leave right now. Dune quickly shook his head. I doubt it, he said. She's probably with her singing group, getting ready. You'll just have to leave the note under her door. Lina could tell from his tone of voice that Dune didn't really want Clary to be home. She supposed he had his heart set on going down the river by themselves. Dune glanced up at the clock on the schoolroom wall. It's a little after two, he said. The singing begins at three. After that, everyone will be in Harkin Square and the streets will be empty. I think we can get to the pipe bar safely then. Why don't we leave about a quarter after three? You still have the key? Dune nodded. So, after I've delivered the note to Clary, I'll come back here, said Lina. Yes, and then we'll wait until 3.15, and then we'll go. Lina got up from the cramped desk and went to the window. She moved the blind a little and peered out. There was no one in the street. The dusty schoolroom was very quiet. She thought about Dune's father, who would be frantic when he saw his son's name on those posters, and then realized later that Dune had disappeared. She thought about Mrs. Murdo, who might already have seen the posters, and who would be frightened if guards came looking for Lina and terrified if Lina didn't come home by nightfall. She tried not to think about Poppy at all. She couldn't bear it. Give me the note, she said to Dune at last. She folded the piece of paper carefully and put it in the pocket of her back pants. Back soon, she said, and went out of the room and down the hall to the rear door of the school. Dune went to the window to watch her go. He moved the blind aside just enough to see out onto Pibb Street. There she was, running in that long-legged way, with her hair flying. She started across Stone Grit Lane. Just before she reached the other side, Dune's breast stopped in his throat. Two guards rounded the corner from Knack Street, directly ahead of her. One of them was the chief guard. He leapt forward and shouted so loudly, Dune could hear him plainly through the glass. That's her! Get her! Lina reversed her direction in an instant. She raced back down Pebb Street, turned down School Street toward Billy Bow Square, and vanished from Dune's sight. The guards ran after her, shouting. Dune watched, sick with horror. She's much faster than they are, he told himself. She'll lose them. She knows places to hide. He stood frozen next to the window, hardly breathing. They won't catch her, he thought. I'm sure they won't catch her.